Hey guys, I've been doing some more work on this Admiral 24A12, checking every last component, and I found a few that are a little bit out of tolerance. I don't have them in stock, so I'm going to place an order. But before I do, I want to check some of my other Admiral TVs that I haven't, haven't gotten around to restoring yet to see if they use some of the same parts. So let me show you what else I got. Alright, first up we got an Admiral 22X12 from 1950. This, I believe, is actually the largest big light cabinet ever made. This is a 12 inch set. Uh, it also has a newer style controls instead of that row of four brass knobs like the other uh, set. This has two controls and what they call a pencil box with the other controls recessed behind here. So, I took a look in the back and right away I can see that this doesn't have that split chassis with the second chassis on the bottom. There's just one up top. And when I look further, it's a different chassis. It's a 20Z1, and the, the parts that I'm going to be ordering are a bit different in this set, so I think I'll leave this for another day. Which brings us to this guy, which is a 30 A16 from 1948, which is a year older than the one I'm working on. This has, got, this has kind of a cool finish, they call a limed oak finish that was popular in the late 40s into the 50s. It's actually red oak, and what they did is they rubbed in like a, like a whitewash or a white paint like across the grain, and I guess wiped it down so it was just, it was trans, sort of like translucent white. Then they put kind of a yellow shellac over it, and you end up with this, well, this limed oak finish. It's damaged in a few spots, and there's a couple chunks taken out of the top, uh, but I hope I can repair that someday. <laughs> Anyways, this set, I actually have the original, uh, or I should say the uh, Sam's photo fact for it, so the service manual and all the parts lists and everything. And I look through these parts, and this set's also a bit, quite a bit different. Although it does have a dual chassis, but this one's quite different. This has two power transformers, and... Uh, the upper chassis is quite a bit different. So, I'm not going to order any parts for this guy right now either. Which leaves one last Admiral console. Now, if you wonder why I have so many Admiral sets, well, Admiral is based in Chicago along with Motorola and Zenith. So, you find an abundance of Admiral, Motorola, and Zenith vintage TVs in this area. In fact, I live about two miles from the old Motorola plant where uh, sets like this was made back in the late 40s. Anyways, this is an Admiral 24C16, which is from 1949, which is the same year as the one I'm working on now, even though this is a 12-inch pitcher tube and a very different cabinet. This is actually uh, wood uh, with veneer that's stained to look like mahogany, although I don't think it really is mahogany. At any rate, when I took a look behind this guy, lo and behold, this is the same chassis. I already pulled out the power supply and I've got it up on my workbench and I already took a look inside here. Now unlike the other set, this one is 100% original components. So I don't dare try to power this set up because the odds of it working are much much lower since none of the parts have been replaced. So let me show you what I got up on the workbench and show you what's involved with finishing these projects off. Okay, here's the power supplies from both of those sets. I'm going to work on them at the same time. While I'm working on one, I can use the other one for reference in case I screw up on something or can't remember how something was wired in originally. <laughs> now this is the one for the Bakelite Admiral. I'm going to do this one first. If you recall from my earlier video, this was a rusted mess. Well, since then, I've stripped this down quite a bit. Normally I wouldn't go this far, you know, like removing the power transformer and chokes and all that. But this chassis is quite simple to work on. Like I said, the benefit of that split chassis is the power supply and the audio amp. Very, very easy to work on. I've already recapped this. I found some pretty nasty capacitors down there too, so it was a good thing I did. There's some of them down here. Now you've heard me go on and on about capacitors and why every restorer tells you you got to replace them. Well, look at this guy. These capacitors were made from organic materials, paper and wax. They will go bad. Whether they're sitting on a shelf, never used, or they've been used hard, they go bad. So I really wouldn't waste your money 
buying new old stock capacitors on eBay. They may be good now, but they're going to fail before too long, so buy new caps. As far as what kind of new caps to buy, well, you can look online. You'll see a lot of debate about it. Um, any capacitor you use that was manufactured recently is going to vastly exceed the specs of the original cap. So, you know, really it's a matter, I'd say, of personal preference and budget. Well, you'll see some arguments that if you're going to restore an American TV or radio, use American-made capacitors like these. These are called orange drops, um, originally made by Sprague or Sprague which I believe is now part of Vichy. You can get them at Mouser Electronics, um, JustRadios.com, and plenty plenty of other sites online. They cost a bit more, uh, but really the only hassle I have with using these is the leads come out straight down from the tubular body, whereas old capacitors, they always came out the ends. So when you replace something like this with something like this, you're going to have to bend these leads out so they go out to the well, the, the axis of the capacitor. In general though, it's not too bad. Another very common type, you can usually get like a grab bag of these generic yellow guys. I've used plenty of these, they work fine. Basically, I've got enough of a stock now that I use what I have on hand. Unless it's something like a specialty circuit, like the high voltage circuit or maybe the audio amp, then I'll, I'll spring for some higher grade more expensive capacitors. Generally though in spite of sometimes the mounting hassles these are really good capacitors to use. For the electrolytics for this project well I want to restuff the cans and which means they got to fit inside the they got to fit inside here. So I had some on hand these aren't going to fit. <laughs> So, even if I could stack them vertically, not going to fit. So I was kind of scratching my head. TV caps are a bit harder to find than radio caps because they generally are higher voltage and higher capacity. In this case, about 40 microfarads at 450 volts. But I did my ser some searching online and I found out that the same manufacturer has a line of skinny high capacity caps. Same capacity, same voltage, but about half the diameter. So, these guys will fit nicely. I, uh, while well, I had the power transformer off and filter chokes, I also polished this down. It was pretty grungy looking originally, like you can see over here, and pretty rusty. And the capacitor was really rusty. So this, I actually used some rust remover on it, sanded it down a bit, and then painted it with some flat black enamel, and I think it looks really sweet now. So I'll be re remounting that once I get done with everything else. Uh, the next step I want to do for this, or I thought you guys might find interesting, is to see how exactly I get these two capacitors inside this metal can. Um, now you could just leave the can in place, sure. Disconnect these two wires down below, wire in these two caps below, solder them in place, no problem. Nobody would ever know the difference unless they pull the chassis out. And that's what I used to do too. But after doing a few projects and you know just for the challenge of it and for a more authentic look, I started to, to give it a try and now I, I kind of like doing it. What I've done in the past though is I've actually removed the can before restuffing it. But uh, I've heard some guys online suggest that if you're careful, you can actually just leave the capacitor mounted to the chassis and work on it that way. So what I'm going to do is take out my Dremel tool, put a cutoff wheel on it, take this out on the back porch, put on some eye protection, and carefully cut around just above this seam. And then hopefully this top will just pull off. May need a little heat, maybe may need a little persuasion. I got to put the camera down while I'm doing that. I'll show you the results in a minute. Okay, out on the back porch. For those of you not familiar with it, this is the Dremel tool. Variable speed rotary tool with a variety of bits. In this case, it's a, uh, an abrasive cutoff wheel. I usually use about one speed below the highest speed while doing this. Don't have a tripod, so I gotta put the camera down while I'm doing this. Hang on. <laughs> 